ready to mic people up. Can you take your place on the stage? I'm always right. <laughs> Hello, Susan. Hi. One, two, three. Oh. Okay, look. Yeah. <laughs> Another mic check, 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 
Yeah, yeah, I just got a note from how it says that it's very noisy. It's hard to hear on the mic, so I didn't do that. Yeah, I think it's a show. I was just a Okay. So the mics will go from one camera to the other, so if I have to sneeze, you don't hear me. I hope. So the mic on that note, might check yet? Yeah. Test one, two, three, four, five, test, 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 testing. It's a little bit different trying to do this debate uh, remotely. Bear with us. We're trying the best we can. We're in unique circumstances. Uh, having a virtual debate is not ideal. I know all of these fine kids would prefer to have an audience here live. Uh, but we're doing what we can and trying to uh, adjust to these times. Let me start by introducing our candidates today. So you know, the candidates drew, before we started, they drew to select positions on stage. They've also uh, they participated in a drawing for the order they'll go in. Starting on my right, to the left, we have candidate Dave Lindstrom, former Kansas City Chiefs football player, businessman. Next, we have Susan Wagle, candidate Susan Wagle. She is currently the president of the Kansas Senate, and she has a long history of service in our state in the Kansas capital. Directly behind me is candidate Chris Kovach. He's the former Secretary of State here in Kansas, and he is also a former law professor. Next, we have newcomer to the race, Bob Hamilton. He's the founder of Bob Hamilton Plumbing, and he just recently made his entrance into the world of politics. This will be his first debate today. And we have candidate Roger Marshall. Dr. Marshall, or Congressman Marshall, uh, currently the sitting congressman for the first district here in Kansas, and he served for many years as a medical doctor uh, in Great Bend, Kansas. With that, we will start our debate as we start all of our meetings in the Republican Party, and that is we will first call for prayer. If you would join us, please, I'd ask Tom Tracy to come forward. Tom will lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, as we gather here today for the Senate debate, we ask that you fill this room with your grace. Today, our focus will be on the five candidates up on this stage, but there are five individuals listening outside this room for which we offer our special prayer request. These five individuals all serve as the rock to a loved one within this room. Lord, we ask that you give Heather Kobach, Tom Wagle, Mary Lindstrom, Lane Marshall, and Teresa Hamilton fortitude, reassurance, discernment, and wisdom. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon these spouses. Fill them and their children with serenity during the ups and downs of the political process. We ask this in your name. Amen. If you would like to remain standing and join me, please, in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, with that, we're ready to get started with our debate today. We have a very special guest with us who will be the moderator of our debate. John Jenkinson is here. He will be the moderator of the debate. You may know him from KSN Ag News, where he serves there. He's also the on-air market specialist for RFD TV and also for Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. John grew up on his family farm in southwest Kansas. He is also the president of the Kansas Flying Farmers. Byron Jenkinson, would you come forward, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, no, that's fine. Oh, I sure. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. The number one industry in Kansas that drives the economy is agriculture. The livestock industry accounts for 60% of this state's agricultural production with more cattle than people. Kansas also makes up 15% of the United States wheat production and ranks seventh in the United States for oil agriculture production. 
That illustrates how important the Kansas senatorial seats are to farmers and ranchers in the United States. The seat that you're seeking being vacated by Senator Pat Roberts has served agriculture very well for his time in the political process. He has served as both the House and the Senate Ag Committee Chair, something that's never been done in the history of our, our uh, country. Um, he's also been instrumental in writing many of the farm bills and uh, rural legislation. With less and less representation in Washington, farmers, ranchers, and all of rural Kansas is going to be counting on you to make sure that their voice is very loud and very heard in Washington, D.C. The answers that you give here today may be some of the most important statements you make to rural Kansans, farmers, and ranchers. And so I wish you all good luck and thank you very much for making time for us today. We drew for our order this morning, and it's time for our opening statements. Mr. Hamilton, you drew number one. We have two minutes for your opening statements this morning. Mr. Hamilton, you go first. Thank you. I am Bob Hamilton, and many of you don't know me, so let me get up to speed. My wife, Teresa, and I have 12 kids and 11 grandkids, so let me answer some questions that probably just popped into your head. Yes, we are pro-life. Yes, we are Catholic. Six boys, six girls, no twins, one wife, and yes, Teresa is a saint. Now, the saint and I started our plumbing company back in 1983. I was in a plumbing truck writing service calls. She answered the phones. Today, the company employs over 160 people with high paying jobs and health care for everyone. Now, I have not been angling for a political office my entire career. Instead, I've been fixing plumbing problems and sewer pipes and overflowing toilets. So, you might say that it's prepared for me for what I'm going to have to deal with in Washington. I'm not a professional politician, and if you want to send a professional politician to Washington, I'm obviously not your guy. Washington is broken because we send professional politicians there to clog the system. I'm an outsider like Trump. I want to drain this wrong. I'm a true conservative from Kansas that will defend life, defend our borders, and defend our Second Amendment. I'm the one candidate who has created a job from scratch that with high paying jobs. So I know when I get to Washington, I can help President Trump rebuild this economy. If I am your nominee, you can know that you will get a true Trump conservative from Kansas with common sense that can win in the fall. So if you want to fix Washington, I got the tools for that. Thanks. Mr. Marshall. Good morning. Kansas is a state with more cattle than people. Agriculture powers over 40% of our economy. And the hardworking farmers and ranchers of Kansas know I have their back. You know, growing up on a, on a Kansas farm, I learned lots of life's lessons. I learned about the importance of an appreciation for the land, and the importance of hard work, the value of a handshake. And just like the farmers and ranchers who know I have their back, President Trump knows that I have his back. 98% of the time, I have voted with President Trump. 98%, that's something no one else can say, but through good times and bad times, through multiple issues, I've stood beside our president. Listen, we need to stop and talk for just a second about the coronavirus. We need to mourn those who have lost and pray for those who are still ill. But my biggest concern today for this state is the emotional scarring out there, the poverty-related illnesses, the loneliness, and the economic challenges put before us. Folks, it's high time that we open this Kansas economy once again in a safe, responsible fashion. That we send our kids back to school this fall in a safe, responsible fashion. It's been an honor to serve Kansas on the House Agriculture Committee. It's been an honor to have the endorsement of Kansas Farm Bureau and the Kansas Livestock Association and a champion for agriculture, Senator Bob Doe. It would be an even greater honor to, to serve this entire state as your next senator. And that's why I'm here today to ask for and only a vote to be
in the election, I would say Senator, and be the next Senator to give Kansas a voice on the Senate Ag Committee. Thank you, and I look forward to this discussion. Mr. Lynch. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome everyone and uh, wish all the audience uh, a happy Memorial Day uh, as we remember our descendants and those who have gone before us. I am not the typical politician that you used to hearing in a forum like this. I played defensive end in the NFL for nine years, and I know how to mix it up in a hostile environment, and that's exactly what Washington is these days. Washington is a dangerous place, and business as usual is not going to get the job done. This job is going to require toughness and grit. When I retired from football, I successfully ran my own business for 25 years, and I did not succeed by spending more than I take in, which seems to be the standard operating procedure for Congress these days. I'm running for the United States Senate because I believe the country is under attack. We're under attack when we have Democrats in Washington talking about socialism as an economic way forward for this country. We're under attack when we have Democrats calling for open borders at the risk and at the jeopardy of our health and health of our, uh, of our citizens. We're under attack when we have Democrats who are disregarding the sanctity of life. They're disregarding the unborn. They're calling for post-birth abortions, folks, pure and simple, that is murder. We're under attack when we have elected officials in Washington, both Democrats and Republicans, excessive spending to the tune of trillion dollar deficits. When Mary and I retired from the Chiefs, we could have lived anywhere in the country, we chose to live in Kansas. And this Kansas is not going to stand Kansas and is not going to stand idly by and watch the sanctity of them and watch the quality of life taken away by short-sighted politicians who want to climb the next one on the ladder. Mr. Lynch, time. Thank you. Mrs. Weber. Thank you. My name is Susan Weber. I'm a wife. I'm a mother to seven, a grandmother to 15. I'm a small business owner. Most important, I'm the Kansas Senate president, and I just led the legislature in a 24-hour marathon session to address the needs of Kansans in response to the COVID-19 crisis. I have just made sure we don't owe penalty and interest on your low-fee property taxes or your income taxes. I have just made sure that there's a new small business low interest loan for farmers, for ranchers, for everyone who's having a hard time paying their bills. Most important, I just rang in Debbie McKelly and her executive orders that were biased, that left all the big box stores open the entire crisis and left the little business guy out of business and shuttered for the last seven weeks. She was the order that went out on Nick Ferguson. down our VFWs and our American legions and those military veterans who have fought for our independence and our liberty still can't go into their local VFW hall, buy a beer and sit down and talk to their friends. I've taken that authority away with her. With the bill that we've passed, any emergency order that comes in the future will have to be approved by the leaders of the legislature. I'm the voice for the vulnerable, for the unborn, for small business owners, for those who don't have a lobbyist in Topeka or in D.C., I'm your candidate that listens to you, and I can't wait to get out on the campaign trail, meet you, hear your concerns, and shake your hands. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you my values and my concerns. Thank you. Mr. Kobach. Isn't it funny how at election time suddenly everybody on the Republican side becomes a conservative? But then after the election, they go into office and they emerge as something else. Well, those of you who followed me in Kansas over the last few years know that I have been a solid deliverer for the conservative movement. As your Secretary of State, I promised the most secure elections in America and delivered. Photo ID, 
proof of citizenship, and security for our advanced ballots that many will be using during this crisis. In immigration, you know my record. I've been advising President Trump for over four years now on his immigration policy. I represented those 10 ICE agents who sued the Obama administration, and in the past year, I led the construction of the first ever privately funded wall in American history. I will now make a commitment to you about the future in the Senate. I can deliver in three ways that others cannot. First, I will carry the ball for the president on immigration. I'm already helping him draft the upcoming immigration bill, and I will carry the ball and, and know this issue more than many other senators can claim. But in times of coronavirus, this is even more important, because when you have a pandemic, borders matter. And when you have 40 million plus Americans out of work, we have to ensure that they are first in line to get those jobs, not people from other countries. Secondly, judges. I was a law professor for 15 years, and I can spot an activist judge a mile away. We need a voice on the Judiciary Committee who can ensure that activist judges do not make it onto the bench. And in so doing, I will protect life, the Second Amendment, and the rest of the Constitution. And finally, cutting government. There are a lot of people who claim to be for small government on our Republican side, but few actually put their, do the, put their money where their mouth is or put the, actually follow through in office. When I was Secretary of State, I cut our agency's budget by 34% over eight years. And I'll take the same approach in Washington. This too is more important after the coronavirus. The left has added $3 trillion to our budget and now they're declaring that that's the new normal. To change that, to go back to where we were, we have to have fighters who will cut and will be serious about cutting spending. And so if you entrust me with your vote, I will deliver for the conservative movement once again. Thank you very much to all of the candidates. We're gonna pause here for just a moment. Um, I also wanna remind us that uh, here in just a moment, we're gonna uh, make sure that we have uh, all of our equipment ready to go. Uh, we're gonna start the uh, question portion of today's debate. That'll be a 90 second response. If there uh, is someone or one of the other candidates that's directly addressed, you know, that, that person that is directly addressed will have a 45 second rebuttal. And again, I'll ask you to be sure and watch, uh, watch our timer here. The, uh, the signals will be the same, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get underway here in just a moment. Mike? Yeah, I, I apologize to the candidates. This, this is an unusual way that we're having to do this debate. I'm getting notes that the audio is not, has not been perfect during your opening. We're going to just take a couple of minutes here, and I want to make sure we get the audio. Uh, for all of you out there, we're going to take a few minutes here, make sure we have the audio working correctly and then we'll start with the questions because I'm getting notes that some of the folks watching live right now that you're having trouble hearing. So we're gonna take just a short break and then we'll come right back. Uh, hopefully it's just gonna be like two minutes. You can either stay there or if you wanna step down, you can do that too, but we already start right back here as soon as we can. <clears throat>
Okay. Thank you, candidates. I, my apologies again. I know these debates are very stressful, and it doesn't help when we have uh, technology problems, but you understand this live streaming is really a challenge for us. For those of you out there, um, understand that the hotel is very limited on staff. We are really trying to do this with skeletal crew, and we're trying to make it the best we can. Um, I understand, I, I was getting texts, several of us were, that you're having trouble hearing. I believe we have fixed it. But several of you have said you didn't hear the openings. And it's just too important, I think, to bypass that. And I've talked to the candidates, and the candidates have agreed that they would do their openings a second time. So we're going to start from the top here, and we're going to start over with openings because I want everybody out there to hear the openings. So with that, we'll get started with the openings. Very well. Mr. Hamilton, we drew earlier today. You drew number one. You are up first. Thank you. I am Bob Hamilton. Many of you don't know me, so let me get you up to speed. My wife, Teresa, and I have 12 kids and 11 grandkids. So let me answer some questions that just popped into your head. Yes, we are pro-life. Yes, we are Catholic. Six boys, six girls, no twins, one wife, and yes, Teresa is a saint. Now, the saint and I started our plumbing company back in 1983. I was in a truck running service calls. She answered the phones. Today, that company employs over 160 people with high-paying jobs and health care for everyone. Now, I haven't been angling for a political uh, office my entire career. I was too busy fixing plumbing issues like unclogging sewer lines and overflowing toilets, so you might say it's prepared me for what I'm going to have to deal with in Washington. If you want to hire a professional politician, I'm obviously not your guy. But if you want to hire someone, <laughs> so much better. Um, but I'm an outsider like Trump. I am a true conservative, and I will defend life, defend our borders, and I'm the one candidate up here on stage that has created jobs, and I know that I can get to Washington to help President Trump rebuild this economy. I am a true Trump conservative that will defend life, defend our borders, and defend the Second Amendment. If I am your nominee, you can know that you will get a true Trump conservative that has common sense that can win in the fall. So if you want to fix Washington, I got the tools for that. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Marshall. Good morning. Kansas is a state with more cattle than people. Agriculture powers over 40% of our economy, and the hardworking ranchers and farmers of Kansas know I have their back. And that's why the Kansas Farm Bureau, the Kansas Livestock Association, and Senator Bob Dole have endorsed us. Growing up on a Kansas farm, I learned many of life's greatest lessons. I learned an appreciation for the land, the importance of hard work, and the value of a man's handshake. Sitting on the House Ag Committee has been a great honor for me to give Kansans a voice, to stand beside President Trump and, and, and write a strong farm bill, to work on fair trade agreements, to, to get E15 year-around, and to roll back waters of the U.S. And just like the farmers and ranchers of Kansas, President Trump knows I have his back. That's because I have a 98% voting record with President Trump. 98%, one of the top 10 voting records in all of Congress, that I've stood beside President Trump through thick and thin, in good times and bad times, that we've stood beside him, just not in word, but in deed. And I'm the only person up here that can say that I've done that. Listen, even though today's discussion is about agriculture, I want to turn the page and talk about the coronavirus just for a second. We need to stop and mourn those who've lost their lives we need to stop and pray for those who are still ill. But my biggest concern today is the loneliness out there, the emotional scars from this illness. I'm concerned about the poverty-related illnesses, and I'm concerned about the economic challenges this virus has left us. Today, even yesterday, we need to get Kansas back open for business in a safe and responsible fashion, and we have to get our kids back to school very soon. We're looking forward to this fall. 
Today, I'm here to ask you for your vote and your support, to earn your vote and your support to be your next congressman and give Kansas its next voice on the Senate Agriculture Committee. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Mr. Lindstrom. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Dave Lindstrom, and I'm running for the United States Senate in the state of Kansas. I'm not the typical politician that you're used to hearing in a forum like this. I played defensive end in the NFL for nine years. And I know how to mix it up in a hostile environment, and that's exactly what Washington is these days. Washington is a dangerous place, and business as usual is not going to get the job done. This job is going to require grit. When Mary and I retired from football, I successfully ran my own business for 25 years, and I didn't succeed in my business by spending more than I took in, which seems to be the standard operating procedure in Congress these days. I'm running for the United States Senate because I believe the country's under attack. What else would you call the Democrats calling for, touting socialism as an economic way forward in this country? What else would you call the Democrats calling for open borders at the expense of life, liberty, and the health of our citizens? And what else would you call the Democrats disregard for the sanctity of life, the disregard for the unborn? They're calling for post-birth abortions. Folks, pure and simple, that's murder. And what else would you call? Democrats and Republicans alike, unsustainable spending that's leading to trillion-dollar deficits. Folks, when Mary and I retired from football, we could have lived anywhere in this country. We chose to live in Kansas because we thought it was the best place to live, to work, and to raise a family. And this Kansan is not willing to stand idly by and watch the quality of life that we enjoy taken away by short-sighted politicians who are looking to climb the next rung on the ladder, who are trying to get elected or re-elected so that they can be somebody. Folks, Washington needs to change if we're going to remain a sovereign nation. I want to be your next U.S. Senator. Go to Washington, support President Trump, and be that change for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lindstrom. Mrs. Wagle. Thank you. My name's Susan Wagle. I'm a wife a mother to seven, a grandmother to 15. I'm a small business owner. Most important, I'm your Kansas Senate president. And I just led the Kansas legislature through a COVID-19 response marathon session that went 24 full hours as we solved problems for the people of Kansas. We made sure that if you're late on your property tax payment or your income tax payment, that you don't have to pay penalty or interest. We made sure, I made sure that small business owners farmers and ranchers have access to a, no, a new, very low interest loan program to help them pay their back due bills. Most important, I reined in Governor Kelly. Her emergency orders have been discriminatory. She's left a big box doors open during the entire crisis and shuttered doors for small business people in the state of Kansas. She alone is the reason why the barber in McPherson had an arrest warrant. Most important, her new orders, what we called 1.5, she shuttered down youth sports. Our kids were ready to go out and play basketball and baseball. They were ready to see their friends again. And even now, as I stand here, she has kept the doors to our VFWs and our American legions closed. Our military veterans who fought for independence and liberty still can't go into their local membership-owned facility and sit down and buy a beer, have a drink, and talk to their fellow, fellow military veteran. Um, when this bill takes place, she will not allow, have any more emergency orders without the approval of the leaders of the legislature. We're going to open up Kansas. We're going to open it up safely. I can't wait to get out on the campaign trail again, shake your hands, meet you face to face. I am your conservative candidate who's been here for you, who's been the voice for the vulnerable, the voice for small business. I'm not funded by the lobbyists in D.C. I'd love to have your vote in August. Thank you, Mrs. Wagle. Mr. Kobach. <clears throat> Every election year, you hear Republican candidates say the same thing. I'm conservative. I'm always been, I've always been conservative. But then when they get into office, you see something different. Some are, but a lot of them are not. You guys know my record. As your Secretary of State, I promised we'd have the most secure election system in America. And I delivered. We have photo ID, proof of citizenship, and equivalent security for mail-in ballots. I delivered for the conservative movement. You know my record on immigration. 
I've advised President Trump for the past four years on immigration policy and continue to work with him. And I will be working with him to deliver the new bill in the Senate that we're currently working on in the White House. I've also represented the 10 ICE agents who, have, uh, sued, who sued the Obama administration in 2012. And last year, I led the construction of the first ever privately constructed border wall in United States history. These are deliveries that I've made for the conservative movement. I've said what I'm going to do, and I deliver. Now, as your senator, I'm making three promises. First, on immigration, I'll carry the ball for the president in the US Senate. He needs someone who knows the issue frontward and backward. I'll be that person. And in times of coronavirus, borders matter. If you can't control who comes into the country, you can't protect the country. And when 40 million Americans are out of work, they do not need to be competing against both legal and illegal foreign labor to get back into the workforce. Second, judges. I was a professor of constitutional law for 15 years. I know what an activist judge looks like. And unfortunately, many senators, including Republican senators, have not been good at stopping activist judges from getting on the bench. I will do so, and in so doing, I'll protect the right to life and the Second Amendment. And thirdly, cutting government spending. A lot of people walk the, talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk on that one. I have. As Secretary of State, I cut my budget by 34% over eight years, and I'll take the same approach to Washington. This, too, is critically important after the coronavirus. The Democrats think that the extra $3 trillion is the new normal. I will not let it become the new normal. I will fight for our conservative values, and I will deliver once again. Thank you, Mr. Kobach. We'll now move into the question part of our debate here this morning. And this will be a rotating order. First up, Mr. Marshall. The question, currently do you have any ties to production agriculture? Well, of course I do. I happen to be the, our family happens to be the proud owner of uh, about 800 acres of land. Uh, very proud to, to work with folks that I, babies I've delivered that are, that are raising cattle there as well. And um, my family still has family farms, fifth generation farms, two of them over 100 years of age. Uh, one in southern Butler County, one in northern Butler County. My biggest tie, though, the last three years, though, has been as your first district congressman. I've helped write the farm bill. That experience has been an extraordinary opportunity and is a great valuable lesson that I can take forward as well. We fought for a strong farm bill. We've rolled back regulations. We've, uh, we've worked with the feeders and the packers trying to solve those problems in the southern southwest part of the state as well, trying to keep this economy going. Very proud to go down there and work with the president to keep the packing plants going, to, to do good testing down there, and to work in their ICUs and their emergency rooms. Uh, so I've been tied to production agriculture my whole life, as a matter of fact, and very proud to do that. Okay. Mr. Lindstrom. Yes. I do have ties to production agriculture. I have a, a farm in, uh, in Miami County, 40-plus acres down there. And if I weren't here today, I'd be down there mowing, cutting branches, making sure that property, that's, one of, that's, that's how I decompress. I love it. I love the state of Kansas. But do I have ties to production Kansas? I've been involved in a program called Leadership Kansas. I served as chair of that organization. And the main, I think the main idea of that organization is to tie people from different parts of the state with other people in the other parts of the state, build relationships so that when things are important to them, they become important to me and vice versa. I do have ties to the production of egg in the state of Kansas. Last week, I went out to western Kansas and I met with the cattlemen. And at the end of that meeting, I learned that we have a dire situation in, in this country and in this state. And I wrote a letter to the president explaining what I thought and what I heard from those folks in western Kansas. So yes, I do have a tie to production in ag in the state of Kansas. Mrs. Weigel. I'm a small business owner. I'm a gardener. And although I'm not a big producer, I've been your voice in the Kansas legislature for many years. Two years ago, when farmers and ranchers said I can't afford my health insurance anymore, I passed a bill that gave you insurance outside of the Obamacare mandates. Your health insurance costs have gone down sometimes 50%. I have been your voice for many years. The voice against the big interests who didn't want that bill, like the insurance companies. No, I'm not funded by the big lobbyists who have big interests. 
I'm here for the little guy to make sure that you can continue to produce your crops, to make sure the supply chains start to open, to look into the regulatory problems we're having right now with uh, the production lines in ag. I'm the voice for small business, for ag, for farmers. I carry your bills, and I'll continue to do that in the U.S. Senate. Mr. Cobot. <clears throat> Yes, uh, I do have ties to agriculture. My wife Heather and I and our five girls live on a crop producing farm. It's not a, not a huge farm, 175 acres, but it is a significant chunk of our income. Um, and of course, in the past, uh, like many of us, uh, we have ties to, family, uh, to farming. My, uh, my, my father and mother-in-law were, were John Deere dealers who have done a farm. My grandparents uh, owned a couple dairy farms. And so, uh, of course, I think most of us have ties to farming, but I actually, have soybeans in the field and actually have a, a very clear sense of, of the, the economics of, of farming, at least on a small scale, and I see what's happening with the, many of the bigger farmers in Kansas. You know, the soybean price right now is $8.35 a bushel. We just drilled our soybeans in a couple days ago. Um, I'm hoping that the price will rise. I'd love to see $16 a bushel like it was in, in 2012, but it, it probably won't get there. But I understand what the soybean farmer or the wheat farmer is up to. Those are our two crops that we drill. And I also have a good relationship with President Trump. In fact, he and I were just on the phone last week, and I was talking to him about the price supports of 2019 and how they did make it, make it good for Kansas soybean farmers. The combination of the price supports with the price of soybeans meant that we were better off in 2019 than we had been in the previous two years. And I think it's important to have a voice for Kansas that knows the president and can convey that to him. But one point about Roger Marshall, he claims he's so happy to be on the Agriculture Committee, then why in 2000? 2018, did he try to get off the Ag Committee and trade that for a seat in Ways and Means? If he's so committed to farmers, he wouldn't have done Time. that. Mr. Marshall, rebuttal, 45 seconds. Yeah, once again, that's fake news, Chris. Uh, certainly, I had a plan to get on the Ways and Means as well as stay on the Agriculture Committee. I would have never left Kansas without a voice on the Agriculture Committee. That's simply not true, and that's why I've worked so hard on Kansas agriculture policy. And not, you know, a farm bill is so much more than, than just crop insurance. There's commodity support programs, there's conservation programs. There's so much in rule for rural America in there as well. So proud of, the, of all the work we've done for the high-speed internet. There was $680 million for high-speed internet in that last bill that we did. And since then, we have another $1.5 billion dedicated. We've taken some of those rural development loans and we've helped build hospitals in Osborne, Kansas, and we've, we've helped uh, to take out loans in residence halls in Lindsburg, Kansas. So a farm bill is so, so much more. Time. Thank you. Mr. Hamilton. First of all, this Memorial Weekend, I would like to take a moment to remember those who have served that, so we can continue to have our freedom. But yes, I am a hunter. Yes, I own some farm ground. And I work with four different farmers. So I know the, the issues because I talk with these farmers. Every one of the farmers that I talk to, they want trade, not aid. 100%, I've yet to talk to a farmer that wants to be subsidized. But the fact of the matter is, we need to stand behind our farmers. We need to have a farm bill. Every one of the farmers I talk to is 100% behind President Trump in the trade deals. They know that he's getting better trade deals for them and for their future generations. China cheats, and we need to deal with China. We need to, they, China rigs the system, and they steal our technology. We have a China problem in this country that needs to be uh, solved. And President Trump is doing that, and our farmers are 100% for him. We also, I talk to them, and they, they need less regulations, but they need government to get out of their way. That's what I will do when I go to Washington, is to get less government, less regulations, and get a farm bill. Thank you. Second question, then. And Mr. Lindstrom, you're going to lead off with this question. If elected for this particular position, what would you do to help make it possible to, to make it uh, feasible for young folks to be able to come back and go back to farming for those who have either left the farm or those who want to farm? Okay. It's a great question. 
And uh, Kansas is a leader. Uh, the agricultural industry, as you've mentioned, as we've mentioned here today, is a, a, probably the most important industry in the state of Kansas. Food supply should be a national security issue. Kansas should be a leader in this field. Kansas can be a leader in this field. People want, young people want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And the Kansas Ag can do that, especially with technology. No one uses technology more than the ag community, other than possibly the military. And to encourage folks to get involved in ag because they love this country would be the way I would help. Mrs. Wagel. The one thing we need in our rural areas of Kansas is access to broadband for everyone. That's what's keeping our young people away. It, it's what can drive our tractors. We can do telemedicine through broadband. And the only way to get it is to take on the big interests in D.C. who have a lot of profit to make, and they just don't make money by running that line out to the small farmer. We need broadband, and the only way to get it done is to tell those big lobbyists that they need to work with us, and we need to have access for broadband all over the state of Kansas, not just the big cities where it's profitable, but out to the little guy. That's the only way we'll get young people back to rural Kansas. It's the only way they can thrive. It's the only way they can continue to do business. Many farmers have spouses who can run insurance claims, who can work out of the home and have a high paying job if we have broadband to their home. That's the biggest need we have right now. And it's the one need we're going to have to take on the big interest in order to make sure we can get it successfully done here in rural Kansas. Mr. Coburn. <clears throat> I have a personal perspective on this. Although I started my career in Johnson County, my wife and I moved our family to the country so that we could live on a farm because that is the good life. That is the ideal Kansas life. And I know many young people who grow up in rural Kansas today would like to stay there. Or maybe if they move to Kansas City for a couple years, they suddenly realize what they left. But in order to stay there, they have to have three things. Jobs, rural broadband, and opportunity. And I think I can deliver all three. Number one, jobs. In order to do that, you've got to keep our taxes low. You have to keep, and you have to keep them low also from an inheritance point of view, from the inheritance of land. And you also have to cut regulations. Rural broadband. You know, with rural, if you have fast enough internet, you can practice law out in the country like I do. You can be an engineer. You can sell real estate. You can sell products all around the world. But you have to have it. There's a $4.5 billion federal aid package for rural broadband that's currently hung up in the FCC. I know how to get things out of bureaucracies. The way you do it is you put time limits on them. So they have to make their decision and then move the program out to where it's needed. And thirdly, rural opportunity zones. Now, these have been tried at the state level, and they have varying success. But we haven't really had a robust one on the federal level. I believe that there should be federal income tax credits for people who leave urban areas and move to the country, or graduates who, after going to college, decide, yes, I'm going to settle in rural areas. The, the size and scope of those credits can be debated. But we need to give the financial wherewithal through th these three mechanisms to allow people who want to live in the best part of Kansas to live in that part of Kansas. Mr. Hamilton. Oh, thank you. Kansas has a history of innovation and, and industry. The rural economy is not just farming. We have uh, other things that can bring people back to rural America, like the biotechnology animal health corridor which I think brought uh, MBEF here to the Manhattan area. We have aviation with Cessna. We have Kubota equipment manufacturing. We have Viega, near and dear to my heart, because they make plumbing products. So the plumbers in your town can bring you clean tap water. So we need government out of the way. We need less regulation. Our rural communities and cities will thrive if we get government out of the way with less reg regulation. We also need a better infrastructure. We need better roads to get out to rural America. And we need better broadband because telemedicine has been proven to work that we can get medicine and healthcare out to our rural communities 
so people can move out there, and then we can help uh, better the rural economy. Mr. Marshall. You know, as agriculture goes, so goes Kansas. And those rural economies are a reflection of that economy. So anything that's good for agriculture is going to help stabilize those rural communities. I've already talked about how hard I've worked with the president to deliver a, farm, a strong farm bill and fair trade agreements. I was so honored to be the only congressman he invited to stand beside him at the UN when he signed the Japanese trade agreement. Ethanol is vitally important to so many of these communities. We have 11 ethanol plants across the state right now. Two are shut down and, and most of them are operating at less than capacity. And we've also talked about rolling back regulations, how important that is. Folks have mentioned the importance of high-speed internet. I'm the person that's actually done it, though. I'm actually the person that's delivered $2 billion of funding, and we continue to improve that situation. Healthcare. Healthcare is vitally important to these small communities, and that's why I fought so hard for programs like the 340B program. I went to Congress, I went to HHS, and got increased funding for our Medicare patients, amounting to hundreds of thousands of dollars of increased reimbursements to hospitals. Look, I've worked with the president to deliver these. But let me tell you who doesn't like agriculture, who wants to destroy our economy, and that's Barbara Boulier and the Socialist Democrats. Listen, their Green Deal is the real thing. They really want that. The Green New Deal is the end of Kansas agriculture as we know it. It's the end of the oil and gas industry as we know it. And that's why we have so much stake in this coming election. Next question then. How would you support the enforcement of the phase one trade deal with China? And are you willing to back the president in whatever steps he takes to enforce that agreement? Mrs. Wagle, we start with you. Well, China hasn't agreed. They agreed to a deal, but they haven't even followed through with phase one. They agreed to purchase things from America. They haven't followed through. They're a bad actor. They've always been a bad actor. They were a bad actor when the COVID virus hit China, and they closed uh, visitation and travel within the country and let, yet let people fly to America and fly to, to other countries. Uh, we need to rein them in, and we need support for the truck for the Trump administration and for Mike Pompeo when they do reign in China, which they will do because once again, they've already violated phase one. They're a bad actor. Uh, they've harmed America greatly. We should be allowed to sue them. We should al be allowed to get back international money, monies that uh, they've taken. They're still violating technology agreements and they still need to be reined in. Nothing's changed with China. We have to have a firmer hand. I'm sure Trump will do that and I will stand with President Trump when he gets that done, and Mike Pompeo, who we're very proud of here in the state of Kansas. Mr. Kobach. We do it with the threat, and if necessary, the imposition of additional tariffs. I have stood behind the President 100% on the imposition of tariffs against China, and thank goodness we have the first President in any of our lifetimes who's actually done something to bring China to the table, who's actually made the Chinese stand up and face the reality that the, China, that the United States is not going to take it anymore. But the president needs people in Congress who will be with him and won't stab him in the back. Now, Roger Marshall likes to tell you about how he votes with the president all the time, but when the going gets tough, he's not there. Last May, he published an op-ed in the Kansas City Red Star, which said, and I quote, Kansas soybean farmers can't stand another round of tariffs. That op-ed landed on the desk of the Chinese president, I'm sure, and it sent a clear message. Republicans in Congress aren't going to support this president. Hold on, because he can't hold on because his Republicans are defecting. Now, he'll say he didn't mean to hurt the president, but I tell you, it hurt the president's position gravely. Marshall's position on China has not been a strong one. After he took a junket to China, privately funded, he then came back and voted twice to fund the WHO, which, as we have all learned now in the wake of the coronavirus, is China's puppet. We have to have someone who's willing to stand up to China, someone who doesn't kowtow to China, and someone who stands with the president when the president does what is necessary. Mr. Marshall, rebuttal, 45 seconds. Well, Chris, I guess that qualifies as throwing the kitchen sink at me. You know there's no space between the president and myself on these issues. I'm so honored that after I speak on trade on Fox News, the president would call me from Air Force One and encourage me. You've made the same mistake twice talking about our tariffs on China. I said the American farmers cannot take more of the Chinese tariffs, that we need to keep standing up on them. But this is just exactly what we're doing. We're helping the Democrats right now. We're helping Barbara Boye win in this election by you attacking me. And just like you handed the governor's race to Laura Kelly, you're about to hand the Senate race to Barbara Boye. 
The president needs a person that's been tried and tested to keep standing beside him, just like I've done. There is no space between the president and myself on, on, on agriculture issues. I'm so proud of that relationship. Mr. Hamilton. Well, this is just an example of polit political nonsense, and this is why I'm jumping in. Because we don't need to just keep arguing about problems. We need to fix them. We need an outsider that can go to Washington and fix problems and not just argue back and forth. It's just the way, the reason I'm jumping into this. We do have a, a trade issue and we do have a China problem. We cannot trust China, we never could. Um, China rigs the system. We know that they cheat and we, we know that they brought us this pandemic. And we need to uh, get our manufacturing back to the United States for all of the drugs that are made in China and all the PPE products. And now they're holding us hostage because they brought us this virus and now they are stockpiling them and they don't tell us that this virus is coming. So let's get our drugs manufactured back into the United States. Let's get our PPE products manufactured in the United States. And let's get a better trade deal with China. We have to be tough on China. So I stand behind President Trump. I know our farmers are 100% behind him. He will get us a good trade deal. Mr. Marshall. You know, we have a couple secret weapons when it comes to these trade agreements. And one of them is our USTR, Bob Lighthizer. And what most people don't realize is that uh, Ambassador Lighthizer came in under a, a Senator Rock, Bob Dole, and he drew up a great trade agreement with enforcement in it. So I'm the person that stood here beside President Trump working through these uh, trade wars, and there's tariffs already built in, so those can be implemented. And we are taking, keeping a very, very, very close eye on the situation right now, and we're going to keep uh, putting pressures on him. Um, soft on China, my goodness, you should take a look at our website right now, on, on our official website, and you'll see how tough I've been on China, the op-eds we've written, the, the legislation that we've signed on to. As a matter of fact, on January 28th, I was the first member of Congress to stand on the House floor and call out China on this whole issue, calling out and giving the warning sign to all of Kansas that this virus is on its way and we better get ready. So I've been so proud to work with President Trump, whether it's stopping China or stopping this virus as well. But you want to know who's soft on China, that's Joe Biden. Joe Biden is another failed candidate who brings fake news all the time as well. He's the person who came out against the president's uh, embargoes against China. He came out against the president on the trade, uh, on the transportation as well over here. Nancy Pelosi, another person who's soft on China. And I can assure you, if we hand this seat over to the Democrats, that Barbara Boye will be another person that's soft on China. I'm the person that has continuously stood beside the president to stop bad trade agreements and to continue to stop the, the illegal things that the Chinese are doing. Mr. Lindstrom. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is, it's, it's not a complicated question. It's not a complicated answer. First thing is we support our president in his policies for tariffs. Secondly, we also want to put America interest first. Third, we're tough. We say what we mean and we mean what we say. We need to keep the lines of communication open because if we're not communicating with our allies and our, and, and our adversaries abroad, we won't accomplish anything. I want to uh, take just a second to talk about, as I have traveled around the state of Kansas and I've talked to, talking to uh, farmers, they, they're not wonderful, they're not real enthusiastic about the impact on them as it relates to these tariffs. But they're willing to uh, suffer short-term pain for long-term gain. They are true American patriots, but they do not want to be martyrs and die on this hill. Next question. Is there an excessive amount of corporate mergers in agriculture? Mr. Kobach, we start with you. Yes, there is. And it's because so much land has become available and has been snapped up by these corporations. And the core reason that so much land is becoming available is because we have a crisis in Kansas ranching. Did you know that in the last 20 years, 6,000, nearly 6,000 Kansas family ranches have gone out of business? Meanwhile, the prices for beef at the grocery store are at record highs, and that was before the coronavirus. The packer is getting about $1,500 per head. 
for cattle, whereas the rancher right now in Kansas is losing $200 per head. There is something wrong with the price situation, the pricing practices in the industry. 11 attorneys general of the states have called on the Justice Department for an investigation into anti-competitive price collusion by the four large beef packers. I support that investigation. But more than that, Congress has to take action. In the House, there is the Prime Act, which will encourage, through deregulation, small and medium-sized packers to come back onto the table, to come back into business in Kansas, and provide some com competitive pricing. There are 42 co-sponsors of that bill, but not Roger Marshall. He's not stepping up for Kansas ranchers. On the Senate side, Senator Grassley has a great bill that I also support. It would require packers to buy at least 50% of all of their beef on the open or spot market. That would allow for transparent, competitive pricing. That, too, would help Kansas ranchers. I haven't heard Roger Marshall say anything about that. He's been there for four years and done nothing to stand up for ranchers. While the Kansas, Roger Marshall's been fiddling while the Kansas ranches burn. Mr. Marshall, rebuttal. You know, I, I have the backs of the f farmers and ranchers of, of Kansans, and this price diversion is an issue I've been taking on for quite some time. I didn't just wake up yesterday and start fighting this problem. Immediately after the Holcomb fire, we saw a price diversion start. And at that point in time, I asked Secretary Purdue to investigate that. He's still investigating it, and now he's moving on to the price divergence caused by the backing off of the packing plants uh, and them shutting down as well. So we're holding his feet to the fire. We're asking him to finish that one up as well so we can get on to, to more important things as well. So I've stood tall for farmers and ranchers. When we had the Starbucks fire uh, down south, I helped through the indemnity program. I, look, I grew up working in agriculture. These are my friends, my family. I'm going to keep standing tall. And when you attack my policy, you're attacking the president's policy. Mr. Hamilton. We do have a problem uh, with concentration. And one of our problems is with the meatpacking industry. We have four companies that are there. And we need more competition. If we don't have good competition, then we're going to have the price gouging that is going on and the price fixing that's been alleged. And yes, I fully support an investigation into that. It is not fair for our ranchers to bring their product to the food processors and they get low ball the price. And then on the other end, the consumers are paying higher prices than ever. There's something wrong there. That needs to be looked at. That needs to be fixed. We need more competition in the meatpacking industry. We also need um, more competition because it could ruin our food chain supply. Meat is an essential product for Kansans. And we need more outlets, more places that our ranchers can bring their products to. So then we don't have these, they have better choices. Let's say. Mr. Marshall? You know, I grew up on a family farm, and once upon a time, you could raise a family on 160 acres of good wheat land in, wheat land in Kansas, but that's not possible anymore. You know, the good news is that 85% of our farms are still family owned, but they're bigger. Brothers and sisters, cousins getting together uh, to make up bigger farms. And they have to do that because the tractors cost $500,000 nowadays. So it's hard to, to uh, harvest maybe 80 acres of wheat and pay off that $500,000 tractor or, or combine. You know, whether it's agriculture or whether it's the banking industry or health care, what creates consolidation of the industries are over-regulations. And that's why I've been working with President Trump since the day I got there to start rolling back regulations to allow more competition. You know, one of my best friends has the packing plant at Ellenwood Packing Plant, and and actually Merlin has passed on, but his family still has it. They have incredible beef. And when I asked Merlin about expanding and letting that meat go across state lines, I wanted to send some for Christmas to some of my friends. He said, Roger, we can't afford to do that. The regulations are so tough that we can't do that. So that's, that's the challenge right now. And the packing plant, four particular uh, companies own 90% uh, of the business. So we need less regulation so people can start a business and still make it. So I'm going to keep working with President Trump and his Justice Department to make sure that we don't have little oligopolies out there running things. Mr. Lindstrom. The answer to the question, uh, are there too many corporate mergers, is yes, there are, uh, especially in the ag business. As been mentioned, there are four major packers in the country. 
three of which are foreign owned. Antitrust laws with, with just three packers, they get to change the rules. They get to lobby. The other problems are, in, in this industry, is mandatory country of origin labeling. They wouldn't have that. We need to have, people want to know what they're buying and where their products are coming from. Our Kansas ag farmers want that too. Ranchers want that. Uh, the, the also, when you have a limited a number of, uh, of packers, you have a control of how the money is spent in the checkoff program. The, the, the a dollar a head per cattle each rancher has to pay, that money is, go, is supposed to go to marketing their product, beef. But too often it goes to lobbyists and benefiting the packers. But yes, we, we need to do that. I also would support uh, Senator Grassley and T Senator Tesler's 5014 rule, which would create 50% of the market has to be a cash basis and killed in 14 days. Thank you. Mrs. Weigel. We are currently in a COVID crisis in Kansas in our packing plants. COVID has threat spread through the plants. Trump has said, keep them open. We're now keeping them open with social distancing, but they absolutely cannot process the meat like they should. Our young, rank, our young ranchers are already bankrupt. They didn't have savings. Those who have been in the business for a while, they're living off their savings. They're about to go bankrupt. Yes, I absolutely support when President Trump said, let's look at this. This is possibly a monopoly because they're putting our ranchers in Kansas out of business, and we need to solve that problem. The inequity really came through in this COVID crisis. Now we know we have a problem. Now we need to address it. And we can't let our ranchers and farmers in Kansas go out of business because they can't process their meat products. We're euthanizing beef. We're euthanizing pork. My goodness, we shouldn't have allowed this to happen. It should have already been prevented. I'm the voice for the little guy. I'm the voice for the Kansas ranchers and farmers and small business owners who are struggling right now, and I'm trying to solve their problems. I've been the reliable conservative voice for many years in Kansas, and I will continue to be that voice if I'm elected to the U.S. Senate. Next question. How would you go about gaining a seat on the Senate Ag Committee? Mr. Marshall, we'll start with you. Well, I think we planted those seeds. First of all, we had the support of hardworking farmers and ranchers across Kansas. Kansas Farm Bureau and its 40,000 members, the Kansas Livestock Association and its five members. You know, Senator Bob Dole is a great endorsement in D.C. as well. I think the work that I've done on the House Agriculture Committee has well prepared me. And Leader McConnell and whoever is the next Senate, uh, Senate leader on that committee replacing our, our own Pat Roberts, I think they're going to look for a person that's a team player that doesn't scourge the, scourge the earth behind him. So I have a great history of bringing people together to pass a very strong farm bill, bringing people together that, that value conservation and the people that, that value the USAID, another program that, that Senator Dole started as well. So I'm going to use my grassroots organization and put my record on the line, showing, showing folks what I've done with President Trump to, to work for agriculture and to make sure that we have a strong voice. You know, actually, we've had a voice on that Senate Ag Committee since 1968, less two years. I might be, I dare say this, I may be the only person that's qualified up here to be on that Senate Agriculture Committee. Growing up in agriculture, owning farms, uh, working in agriculture, I can speak the language. And then finally, just the, the legislation that we've worked with so far has done so much for agriculture, and I look forward to being your next voice on that Senate Agriculture Committee. Mr. Lindstrom. Yes. First of all, I would arm wrestle whoever made the decision. <laughs> um, yes, I would gain a seat on the Ag Committee. And I'd do it for a couple of reasons. I'd, I'd be able to do it for, this is how I would convince someone. I would make sure that whoever's making those decisions know how passionate I am about my state and how important ag is to this country and how important our food supply is to our national security. And I would also let them know that there's no one on this stage or in this state that will represent the folks of ag better than I will because, uh, not because I know a lot about ag, but because I will listen I will hear what they say, I will act on what they do, I will follow up on myself, and then I will ask the people that I go out to talk to, the people of the ag folks of this state, 
to follow up and measure me. Thanks. Mrs. Weigel. Thank you. Getting on the Ag Committee would be my first priority, and once I'm on that committee, I'll never ask, as others have, to get off that committee. I've already traveled around to Farm Bureau committees all over the state and said that is my top goal. I've already sat down with Jerry Moran. I've already sat down with Pat Roberts, and I said if I get elected, please help me. I want to be the voice of ag. I want to be the voice for the little guy who's getting hurt by the big businesses, and I want to be on that committee, and I will stay on that committee. I've traveled the state of Kansas already before the COVID crisis. I've been the voice of agriculture for many years in the legislature. I appointed Dan Kirshen, uh, who was our Sedgwick County Farm Bureau uh, president, and he's now our chair of ag, and I have a great ag committee in the Kansas legislature. We respond to the needs of Kansans, and I'm, I've stood with you for many years. I'll continue to stand with you, and my first priority be, will be get on the ag committee, and then once I get on, I promise to stay on. Mr. Coma. I think Kansas has a very strong chance of maintaining a presence on the Ag Committee. We've had that, that seat there for many, many years, and I will too be asking for that seat on the Ag Committee. I think I have a, a credible claim to it. I think senators should ask for seats on committees where they add value. I'll be asking for agriculture because we live on a farm and we understand and we receive those price support checks and we see it firsthand. I'll also be asking for a seat on the Judiciary Committee because I have that expertise to add. I think that's important. But I think in addition to just being on the committee, you have to be willing to lead the committee. And I'm willing to say that there have been times in the past where the Ag Committee has made the wrong decision. Let's take country of origin labeling, which Dave brought up. Uh, that's a great point. We had mandatory country of origin labeling for a few years, but then there was a case brought by other countries, surprise, surprise, in the World Trade Organization. And the World Trade Organization found to no one's surprise that yes, if you tell people where beef comes from, they're more likely to buy American beef. Well, duh, of course. But after that, the Ag Committee had a hearing or two and they decided to go ahead and surrender and stop doing mandatory country of origin labeling. I wouldn't surrender and I would try to persuade my committee members that we have to fight back. We don't answer to the WTO, we answer to Kansas farmers and American farmers. I agree with Senator Josh Hawley that it's time to abandon the WTO. Before the 1990s, we had bilateral agreements with all of our trading partners and we did just fine. The WTO has sheltered China and has sheltered other countries with unfair trading practices. So we not only have to be on the committee, we have to lead the committee. Mr. Hamilton. I'd love to get a seat on the Ag Committee, uh, but I am an outsider and you just got to show me how to do that. because. You know, how do you begin? I know that I have credentials to get on the, the Ag Committee. I know that farming is a way of life. It's not just a job. And farmers need to be protected. We need to get a farm bill. Farmers need the assistance of a farm bill. The farm bill and the welfare bill should be separated. 77% of the money goes to a welfare bill? That's not right. Let's get a farm bill and let's support our farmers so we can um, get, you know, have their back. They need a safety net out there. They're growing broke right now with this COVID-19 that's going on. They need protection. And I, I would get on that Ag Committee just to protect our farmers. I own several farms, I work with several farmers, I know the needs of our farmers, and I know that they need less regulation and getting government out of the way. I'm for President Trump to get rid of regulations and get a farm bill passed. We have six more questions, but we're only going to use one of them. <laughs> we're down to our, our last question. Uh, final question, are you in support of moving additional USDA staff to Kansas City, and why? And we'll start with you, Mr. Lindstrom. Absolutely, yes. I've, I've said this repeatedly, that uh, ag is the number one industry in the state of Kansas. We have, between Columbia and Manhattan, the Animal Health Corridor. We have MBATH here in Manhattan. We have the National Institute of Food in Kansas City, moving to Kansas City, who brought 60 jobs uh, recently. So absolutely, uh, it has been mentioned here earlier that 
the, a, a great education and the prospects of good employment is what's going to bring people to this area. So absolutely, I would be in favor of, of doing that. Yes. Mrs. Wagel. Well, I'm in favor of moving the Department of Ag to Kansas City, Kansas, not Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> We have a Sprint campus, campus in Kansas City, Kansas. It's absolutely perfect for the facility. I would have liked to have been around Manhattan, where we have a lot, where, where we already have InBath. But we're going to have to stick with Kansas City, and I would prefer for it to be on the Kansas side. Absolutely, that needs to be done. Where we have people here who are close to the ag belt and and the production lines, and close to the people of Kansas, it needs to happen. And I'll make sure it happens when I'm in the Kansas Senate. It would be right for Kansas to be the right thing to do for the people of Kansas to be close to the producers, to the farmers, to the ranchers, would make them more in touch with our needs, with our local needs, with all that's happening, especially in this crisis. Mr. Kobach. Uh, absolutely, I'd be in favor of moving uh, FD USDA operations to Kansas City. Um, you asked why specifically. Two reasons. One, you're closer to the actual issues, and two, it saves money. Let me give you an example about being close to the issues. You see this in Washington all the time. I've served at the Justice Department, and I was there when the Department of Homeland Security was created. What happens is people get in this Washington bubble, and they don't get out and talk to the people on the ground. So to take Department of Homeland Security for, as an example, I have many friends who are Border Patrol officers, and I'll find out about something that's happening all over the border, but then when I go back to Washington, the DHS doesn't even know. The brass in Washington don't even know what's going on. The same thing, I'm sure, happens in agriculture. You have people, things happening on the ground with farmers that, that the USDA does not, uh, is not aware of or doesn't know the details about. The second is saving money. And the reason it will save money is simply cost of living. Um, if you take people out of the very expensive uh, Washington, D.C. area where the price of housing is exorbitant and the price of food is exorbitant and you move them into a place like Kansas City, you save the federal government money. And we need to be saving money right now because, remember, we're now $3 trillion additional dollars in debt because of dealing with the coronavirus issue. We have got to be looking for ways to cut costs. Mr. Hamilton? Yes, I would agree with moving the USDA to Kansas City. I would also agree on the Kansas side would be great. We are the heartland. We're very centralized right here. So they can be very close to uh, ag. And I think this is the heartland of America as our farmers are feeding the nation here. But we also need to make sure that we can get regulations out of the way so our farmers can get government out of the way. We need lower taxes. We need to get rid of the death tax so farmers can pass on their uh, farms to generation to generation. And we need better trade deals. And every farmer I talk to is fully supportive of Trump in getting better trade deals. And I support Trump, and I support our farmers, and I will have our farmers back. Mr. Marshall. You know, I'm the candidate up here that's not only talked about it, that's actually done it. I was partially responsible for moving that research off to Kansas City, research office to Kansas City and those jobs. And like several have said, it does save taxpayer money. It does put the research closer to the boots on the crown, closer to the farmers. Those are great things as well. I'm very proud of our animal health corridor. Uh, over 60% of America's dog food is manufactured there. So one of the bright spots in the economy is the animal pet industry as well. Very proud of the work of InBAF right here at my alma mater, Kansas State University. I think I've done six tours there uh, with the DHS, USDA, uh, Kevin McCarthy. So I'm very proud of my university, very proud of InBAF here. So there's so much synergy opportunities. But this just brings the point home how important an agriculture is in this election and what's at stake. That if, if we send the wrong person, if we send a failed candidate to the fall election, that agriculture is done as we know it. The Green New Deal will be the end of Kansas agriculture, the end of the Kansas oil and gas, gas industry. So this is so important that we send the right person to make sure where we keep a Senate majority as well. I'm the person that stood beside President Trump to accomplish these things, whether it's trade. We've negotiated over 55% of our agriculture trade agreements so far. And, and the USMCA should be implemented right now. I've been proud to stand beside President Trump through moving the USD offices here. Happy to do more. We're going to keep working on the trade. Thank you. Candidates, we've come to the time for our closing statements. We'll go back here to the drawing. And um, up first, 
Mr. Hamilton, you'll have two minutes for your closing statements. Mr. Hamilton, please proceed. Make sure my mic works. All right. Look, this campaign, this campaign comes down to this. Do you want to send a professional politician to Washington, or do you want to send a plumber to help drain the swamp? I'm not a professional politician, and I don't have all these canned answers. I don't do political speak. I speak plainly, but I speak of conservative, common sense values of Kansans. Now, we have one candidate who is conservative, but he can't win in the fall. And we have one candidate that is not conservative and thinks he can win in the fall. But we don't have to choose because you're lucky. I am a true conservative that can win in the fall. And this is important. We have to win. The stakes are high. We cannot pick the wrong candidate and allow the Green New Deal or socialized medicine. We can't have open borders. I am a true conservative from Kansas that will defend life, defend our borders, and defend our Second Amendment rights. I will also be in full support of any conservative judicial appointee. I'm the one candidate up here that has created jobs, created a business from nothing. And I know I can get to Washington to help re President Trump rebuild this economy. So I am, uh, if, you, if you want to elect me as your nominee, you can know that you will get a true conservative with common sense that can win in the fall. So Washington is broken, but I got the tools for that. Mr. Marshall. Listen, the future of this nation is at stake right here in Kansas. That's right. This fall, Kansas can well decide what, the, what our future Supreme Court justices are going to look like because the majority is going to run through Kansas. We're going to determine if we're going to have open borders and sanctuary cities. We're going to determine if we have a strong military. We're going to determine if we're going to protect our Second Amendment and we're going to protect the sanctity of life. We're going to determine what, if we want a new Trump economy, a strong Trump economy again, or are we willing to turn this over to, to, to the Democrats once again? Listen, we all have much at stake right now in Kansas. We have so much at stake. We cannot afford to send an, a failed candidate back this fall who will lose to Barbara Boyer and hand the Senate majority over to Chuck Schumer. Instead, we need to send a tried and trusted friend of President Trump, one that stood beside him through good times and bad times, through an impeachment, th through the corona crisis, through the trade wars. Listen. Barbara Boyer and the Socialist Democrats will destroy our economy. They'll destroy our nation. They're going to destroy our way of life. And that's why we need to make sure we send a person that can keep the majority in Kansas hands and in the, and in the Republican hands. Look, it's been a great honor to serve as your congressman. I felt President Trump build an economy once, and I'm going to help him do it again. But I'm going to need your help. And that's why I'm asking for your vote on August the 4th. Thank you so much. God bless each and every one of you that's listening. God bless your families. God bless our nation. And God bless my home, Kansas. Mr. Lindstrom. Thank you. Einstein, his, he had a definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different result. I'm running for the United States Senate because I'm tired of the Kansas insanity. I've had enough of career politicians who are divisive, controversial, have a record of mismanagement, and losing to Democrats in big elections. Kansas can do better. I've had enough of short-sighted, self-serving politicians who campaign to be on the Ag Committee and once elected, lobbied to get off Ag and onto Ways and Means. Why? so they, they could fund their political ambitions. Do we want to repeat that again? I've had enough of party politics in the Kansas swamp that unprofessionally tried to take away the right of Kansas voters to choose their next senator. Have you had enough? 
If you've had enough, I offer you an option. I offer you a businessman, a proven businessman, who has the right combination of authenticity, of toughness, of temperament, of public service, and community commitment. I will always be committed to you, the Kansas voters, and I don't represent special, uh, special interest. I win elections. I humbly ask you for your support and your vote on August 4th. God bless you, and God bless the great state of Kansas. Thank you. Mrs. Weigel. Agriculture is the backbone of the Kansas economy. It's very, very important that we send a leader to the U.S. Senate who's articulate, who's persuasive, who other people respect, who can gain the trust of everyone they work with in the U.S. Senate. I'm that candidate. I tell my farmers and ranchers that I'm a small business person. I create a product. I hope to make a product. But for farmers and ranchers in Kansas, they have to deal with other problems I don't have to deal with. They work under the orders of tariffs and trade deals that they had nothing to do with that affect their profit. They have to work under God-given weather circumstances. We never know if there's going to be enough rain, too much rain, or if we're going to be in a drought. And that's why agriculture leaders here in Kansas need a strong, articulate advocate in the U.S. Senate. I have a proven, reliable, respected record. I am pro-life. I have a 100% vote with the NRA. NFIB, you name it, a 100% perfect record. And more important than that, my colleagues elect me the leadership because they respect what I have to say. They know I care about Kansans. They know I have a passion for protecting small business and protecting vulnerable life and protecting your gun rights. They know where I'm at. They don't have to ask. I'm the one lady who's already debated Barbara Boyer. I'll take her on in the general and I'll win. I win on the Senate floor. I've beat her numerous times. I'm the one candidate, the conservative voice that can beat that liberal voice in the U.S. Senate. You know who I am. I appreciate your voice. I, I, I have enjoyed working with you for many years, and I hope to continue being your voice in the U.S. Senate. Mr. Kobach. You know, they say you can tell something about a person by the company he keeps. And I've been honored over the course of my career to keep company and have the endorsement of leaders of the American conservative movement, like Ann Coulter, like Sheriff David Clark, like David Barton, and most recently, Dr. James Dobson. I'm honored to have those endorsements of those conservative leaders. I've also been honored to be endorsed early by Gun Owners of America and the National Association of Gun Rights, and of course, I have an A-plus with the NRA. And the Border Patrol Council got in and endorsed too, and they rarely endorse in Senate races, only when they, they feel that it is decisive that this person must be a U.S. Senator. But you know, you can also tell a lot about a person by who his enemies are. I'm the only person on this stage who has been criticized and called out by name by Chuck Schumer, Sheila Jackson Lee, AOC, and Rachel Maddow. Now why is that? Did they just Google conservative and pick my name? No, it's because they've seen the specific things I have done in immigration and election security, and I pose a challenge to them and their agenda. So that poses a question for you. Do you want a go-along to get-along kind of senator, a gutless wonder who never takes a stand, or do you want someone who poses a threat to Chuck Schumer, to Sheila Jackson Lee, to AOC, and to Rachel Maddow? You know, we're in a new more combative era in American politics. Gone are the days when Bob Dole could reach across the aisle and shake hands with Scoop Jackson and work out a, a bipartisan deal that was in everybody's interest. The left has declared war, ladies and gentlemen, on our Second Amendment rights, on the right to life, on our Constitution, on capitalism. You go right down the list and they're using the coronavirus now as an additional excuse to declare war on all that we hold dear. We need to send a fighter who will stand firm in the United States Senate. Yes, I will continue to be attacked by the media, but I don't care. Why don't I care? Because I remember that I'm working for you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joy. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us today here from Manhattan, and a special thank you to each of our candidates, Dave Lindstrom,
Susan Wagle, Chris Kobach, Bob Hamilton, and Roger Marshall. Thank you to all five of these U.S. Senate candidates. Uh, the debate was excellent today, and we appreciate you all taking the time to do this. I also want to give a shout out to our moderator, John Jenkinson. Thank you so much for uh, your excellent work today moderating this debate and keeping it uh, in interesting for all of us. And be sure you catch John on, um, on his talk radio shows, on the Ag Radio. And last, I want to thank uh, our crew that helped today. We had an uh, audiovisual uh, contractor that came in and helped us today. I know we had a hiccup at the beginning, but thank you for helping us get that sorted out. Uh, what we will do is upload the video. We will fix the beginning part so it starts with the opening statements that you could hear. But a big shout out and thank you uh, uh, to our contractor for helping us get through that moment. Uh, as some of you know, with this coronavirus, uh, we worked very hard to get a hotel, but the hotel staff has been furloughed. So uh, we've been doing all kinds of things today as your Kansas GOP that uh, normally uh, the, the hotels handle for us, but, but we made it work. And it's been a great debate, and thank you all so much for being with us today. And be sure to watch for the video to be uploaded. So with that, thank you all. Thank you from Manhattan, Kansas, and thank you for this debate on ag and rural issues. Thank you, and goodbye.